Therapy Chat Podcast, episode 220. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. Today's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes. Between writing notes, filing insurance claims, and scheduling with clients, it can be hard to stay organized. That's why I recommend Therapy Notes. Their easy-to-use platform lets you manage your practice securely and efficiently. Visit TherapyNotes.com to get two free months of Therapy Notes today. Just use the promo code THERAPYCHAT when you sign up for a free trial at TherapyNotes.com. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, and today's episode is one that I've been very excited to bring to you. I'm speaking with a therapist who is also a best-selling author. My guest today is Lori Gottlieb. Lori is a psychotherapist and New York Times best-selling author of Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, which is being adapted as a television series with Eva Longoria. In addition to her clinical practice, she writes the Atlantic's weekly Dear Therapist advice column and contributes regularly to the New York Times and many other publications. She is also a TED speaker, a member of the Advisory Council for Bring Change to Mind, and advisor to the Aspen Institute. A contributing writer for the Atlantic, she has written hundreds of articles related to psychology and culture, many of which have become viral sensations. She's a sought-after expert in media such as the Today Show, The Morning America, the CBS Early Show, CNN, and NPR's Fresh Air. I am very excited to bring you today my interview with Lori Gottlieb. Therapy Chat Podcast wouldn't exist without the support of its listeners. If you'd like to become a member, please go to patreon.com slash therapy chat. By making a $1 per month donation, you can help Therapy Chat keep going over the long haul. Thank you for your support. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm so excited today to be bringing you an interview with someone who I am fascinated by, Lori Gottlieb, MFT, who is the author of Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, A Therapist, Her Therapist, and Our Lives Revealed. Lori, thanks so much for being my guest on Therapy Chat today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very happy that we are talking and I want to talk about your book, but before we even get into it, can you just give a little introduction for our audience to about who you are and what you do? Sure. I am a psychotherapist. I have a private practice in Los Angeles and my most recent book is Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. And I have this hybrid career where I see patients and I also write and I also speak. I just did a, a TED talk and I, I also write the, the weekly Dear Therapist column for The Atlantic. Yeah. So you you have a fascinating combination of being such a talented writer and storyteller as well as being a therapist. And I think that's so cool. Well, I think that what we do as therapists is that we we're working in story every day and, you know, people's lives are stories. They're really interesting stories. Sometimes we don't think that our own stories are interesting, but I think they're fascinating. And so, you know, I, I talk a little bit in the Ted talk about how I think what we really do is we edit people's stories and people come to us with a story that maybe is a faulty narrative and, uh, we help them to rewrite that story so that it reflects the present more accurately and also kind of lets them out of jail. I think a lot of our stories are about being trapped in some way, being confined in some way, being limited in some way. And and a lot of the time, that's just not true. Yeah, that really resonates for me. It's like the meaning that people make of situations that arise, and it usually comes down to something about how they are unworthy or they they can't trust anyone or there's they're alone. 
Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's what I do in the Ted talk is I sort of, I, I take a dear therapist letter that I got and I question not the validity of her story because I think everybody's story is accurate just from their current perspectives. Right. So there's a lot more to the story. And so, you know, and then we kind of look at, well, how might, the other version of the story be written. And I think that we all need to do that in our lives. And that's what I do. And maybe you should talk to someone is I take, I follow the lives of four seemingly different patients. And then there's a fifth patient. And that fifth patient is me as I go through my own therapy. So you see me as both clinician and, and patient. And you can see that I do with my therapist, what all of my patients do with me. I do the same kinds of things because that's what it's like to be a person in the world. You know, we all sometimes need another perspective. Sometimes we need another person who's there to say, let's look at this in a different way. Yeah. You just succinctly, and I guess it's because you're the author and you've, (laughs) you know, your book really well, but you just succinctly described what I think is so complex about your book that you talk about your four patients, I always say clients, so I might, you know, use both words, but your four clients and their experiences and how you are experiencing them. And then the fifth client, which is you and how you are in your therapy and how it mirrors what your clients are bringing to you. But I, I loved this book so much. I mean, and every therapist I've talked to who's read it and so many therapists are reading it. Everyone raves about it. I've never heard anyone say anything but positive words about it. Wow. That's so nice to hear. Yeah. So congratulations, really. (laughs) Thank you. It's obviously and it's a huge bestseller. So it's, it's amazing. But the, the nuance and the depth that you go to, um, it's like on one level, you're, educating the reader about the process of therapy. And you literally, you know, pause and say, what was happening here was, you know, you talk about attachment, you talk about therapeutic rapport, trust issues, just everything that comes up in therapy. So that anyone who's reading, whether they're a therapist or have ever been to therapy or not, can understand, oh, okay, so that's what's going on here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's it's this it it does a lot of things that I felt like I get to see every day in the therapy room, but nobody else is there. Right. So what we do feels very solitary in a lot of ways because, um, you know, we have our consultation groups or at least most of us do. I do. And, you know, there's nobody in the room to say like at minute 22, that was a great intervention, you know, (laughs) you know, or there's nobody there to say like at minute 22, here's what I would have done differently. You get a little bit of that in your consultation group. Based on whatever you choose to share there, right? Right, right, right. And also then again with story, like here's your perspective, right? They're not in the room. So you're telling it from how you view the situation. Right. Your your client might say something very different about what was not working in that moment. And so, you know, but I think that there is something what I'm trying to do in the book is part of it is I'm I'm telling these people stories and I'm telling them in the way that I experience them, which is at the beginning people will have a certain impression of the people that I introduce to them. And as they get to know them, they'll start to see them very differently. In fact, quite differently from they did when they first met them. And the same thing maybe about me and my own therapy, where I'm presenting my situation and my kind of presenting problem in a very specific way, which is I want my therapist to agree with it. I want my therapist to validate my position. And of course, he doesn't, which is the best thing that could have happened because you want someone who's going to, you know, I talk in the book about the difference between idiot compassion and wise compassion, where idiot compassion is what our friends do. They're like, yeah, you dodged a bullet. That guy was a loser, you know, or yeah, it's so your boss is so, so wrong not to promote you or, you know, whatever it is when really there might be a pattern in our lives that we're not seeing, or we might've had a role in it. Even if those other things out there are true, that we might've had a role in how we danced with the other person metaphorically, right. In, in that relationship. And so wise compassion is what therapists do is they hold up a mirror to the to the client and they say, here, I want you to look at your reflection and I want you to see it in a way that maybe sometimes you're not either willing or able to. 
And that's where the growth and the transformation come in. Yeah. Yeah. If it was just an echo chamber where you complain and the therapist is like, yeah, all those people in your life are terrible. They're so bad. You know, like in the, I think it's the first client, I think John, who thinks everyone is an idiot. Yep. And if you were like, yeah, they're all idiots, you know, and how are you going to begin to cope with all these idiots in your life, you know, without actually helping him gain a perspective about there's more going on than just that all these people are idiots. Right. And of course, you know, that was his way of without giving away any spoilers that that was his way of protecting himself from from the unspeakable, from this unspeakable pain that he was in, um, which I didn't see coming. I knew there was something, obviously, because Mm -hmm. people the way people act toward you gives you information. So people's behavior is is a nonverbal way of saying, I'm in a lot of pain. And this is why I have to keep you at a distance. But I didn't know why. And I was really surprised by the why. And I think a lot of readers are too. And I wanted them to have that experience that I had of having that shock of the why. Because I think that it really shows that we can't judge people based on an initial impression that most of us are, we have, you know, we're all more the same than we are different at our core. And I think that we forget that because we don't see what those universal struggles are in day to day interactions with people. But I think it's really important to remember that, you know, we're, we all are struggling with very similar things and maybe we react to them differently, but we need to have more compassion, not only for other people, but also for ourselves. And, And I'll say one more thing about, this idea of, you know, a problem being external or circumstantial where people will come in and they'll say, I want to change. And what they really mean by that is, but I want everybody else to change. You know, I, yeah. I want to change and now help me change everybody else in my life. And it doesn't work that way. And at the same time, a very wise supervisor, when I was training, said to me, before diagnosing someone with depression, make sure they're not surrounded by assholes. Mm hmm. And I, and I think you have to, you know, you have to take into account the entire picture that, yes, they might be surrounded by assholes. But why are they as an adult where you have a lot of freedom that you didn't have as a child? Why are you still surrounded by assholes? What, what are you, you know, and, and how are you choosing to react to the way these people are behaving? And, and I think that people forget how much freedom, how much agency they actually have as adults that they didn't have when they were growing up. It's almost like wearing clothes that don't fit you anymore. It's like you're wearing your childhood emotional clothing. It doesn't fit anymore. And so it's time to get a new wardrobe. It's time to say, oh, wait, I don't have to wear those old clothes that don't fit anymore. I can do something different. Yeah, those patterns like you were talking about that we just replay those patterns and reenact those relationships and from childhood and and those childhood ways of relating or family of origin ways. And then, you know, things continue. And it's like, why am I always having this problem? Why is every guy I date the same? And, you know, all of well, those things. A, and we don't know why. Right. And that's that's what happens with one woman in the book, Charlotte. She's in her 20s and she keeps hooking up with the wrong guys and she doesn't understand why. And she thinks the problem is them. And she doesn't realize that she has radar for the kind of person, the kind of partner who will disappoint her because that's what's familiar to her. And I think sometimes we don't realize how strong the pull is of the familiar, even if the familiar was was miserable or unpleasant. It's still home to us in some way. And so it takes some awareness of, oh, that's what I'm doing. At some point, she even, you know, starts dating this guy from the waiting room that she meets in the waiting room at my office. Oh, and and she says, well, it's a step up because at least he's in therapy. And I can see from a mile away that, you know, this is this is just the same guy, different name. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, and of course, that that's what it turns out to be. And, 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 you know, I think sometimes people change. I like to say gradually, then suddenly that, you know, it takes them a while to kind of keep doing the same thing over and over until finally they start to make some movement and then they start to change. But I think people don't realize just how hard change is and they get, they're really hard on themselves about the fact that they're not changing. And I I, I talk too in the book about how unkind we can be to ourselves, that I had a, a patient who 
I had her write down everything that she said in her mind for the next few days after our session and come back the next time and, and let's look at it together. And she got in the room and she looked at her page and she said, I can't read this out loud. This is so embarrassing. I am such a bully to myself. And she had no idea how unkind she was to herself and, and things that you would never say to a friend in the same circumstances. And, you, and the, the litany of things that we say to ourselves, like just in the course of an hour, like, oh, my God, I'm so stupid. Oh, I'm such an idiot. Oh, look, you catch yourself in a mirror. I look terrible, you know, or, oh, you know, I don't I, I can't get that you know, like that job or that person or whatever it is that you want. It's it's really important that we listen to the, the voice that we're going to hear the most in our lives. We talk to ourselves more than we will talk to any other person throughout our entire lives. And let's make sure that we're a kind audience to ourselves. Yeah. Let's just pause for a moment so I can give you a little bit more information about why I love therapy notes. I switched to therapy notes a few years ago. I'd say it's about three years now, I believe. And I have never regretted it. I was very happy with the EHR I used before, but therapy notes is more intuitive. I love the interface. The customer service is fantastic. And I love how I can get my notes done quickly because I can customize the template that I use for my notes and there are opportunities to put check marks rather than having to write out the intervention used. So I have cut my time spent writing notes way down, which is wonderful because I like to focus on seeing clients. I know documentation is an important part of our work, but it can also be time consuming. And that is why I love using therapy notes. If you are considering switching EHRs or you're looking for one to use in your practice, give Therapy Notes a try. You can get two free months by using the code TherapyChat. Now let's get back to our interview. Yeah, that's so true. And I think one of the, um, one of the things I love about your book, and it's like a parallel to our lives, is reading your thoughts while you're hearing, you know, it's like you're telling us what the client is saying and then what you're thinking and then what's going on in your life. And then all the clients seemingly are unrelated in their, their issues, but how these common themes come up, it's just, it's so well done. And really it was extremely moving to me. I mean, I don't know if that's how people are experiencing it. But to me, it was just so, it was very poignantly emotional. Yeah, I, I think so. That is the feedback that I'm getting. And I think that it accomplishes the one thing that I wanted it to accomplish, which, which is that people see themselves in every single one of these stories. And I see myself in every single one of my clients in some way. Mm-hmm. And, and so I think that all of the chapters are, my editor had said at the time that, that my chapters are in conversation with each other. And I love that phrase in conversation with each other, because I really feel like thematically, everybody's dealing with the same kinds of ultimate concerns that I talk about Yalom in the book a little bit and his ultimate concerns. And we're all, you know, we all want to love and be loved. We all how do you know question like how do we deal with regret how do i deal with what i can't change what can i change you know how do i deal with anxiety sadness how do i move forward grief is a big is a big thing in the book you'll see in many different ways you know we all experience grief and i think when i say the word grief so many people think death but it doesn't have to be death a literal death although in the book there there's some of that too but i think there's grief around you know, just loss in general, loss of youth, loss of opportunity, loss of a time in one's life, loss of, you know, your child growing up, there's loss in that. So I really feel like that not only are the chapters in conversations with themselves, but I I feel like 
I hope that what people are getting out of the book is that they're seeing themselves in a new way, that that mirror is held up to them because it's so much easier to see ourselves through the lens of somebody else's story than to say to someone, hey, you do this. You're like this. <laughs> Have you noticed you do this? Um, right. Mm-hmm. And and so it's so much easier for someone to read the book and say, oh, I see a little bit of myself in this. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I'll tell you for me when I'm <laughs> I even have a male therapist myself and your therapist in the book is a man, Wendell. Yep. And um, I'm reading your client's words. You know, I know it's not really one client's words, but as you write the story in the book, I'm reading what they're saying and what you're thinking and then what your therapist says. And I'm thinking, does my therapist think that about me? You know, like, <laughs> so it's just like on so many levels. <laughs> But I think what it does is it opens up a conversation because one of the things I say early on in the book, I say two things that I think are related to that. One is that I say that I think that my most significant credential is that I'm a card carrying member of the human race Mm -hmm. that, you know, and I think that our humanity is what helps us to help people. Nobody wants to go to, you know, these tropes of therapy, right? Like nobody wants to go to the brick wall, a person who just uh has you or is very, you know, sort of that cold removed therapist. And at the same time, nobody wants to go to the train wreck, you know, which is, and I think that in, in popular culture, those are the two tropes of the therapist. They're either, you know, completely neurotic, you know, falling apart in their own lives, or they're just very cold and removed and we don't get a sense of them as a person. I think, you know, they're doing a, a, we're doing a TV series of the book. And, you know, one of the things that's really important to me is that the therapists in the, in the show are real people like that, that they're normal people like that. Um, I use the word normal sort of in quotes, but I mean, in the sense of, in the, in the broad swath of humanity. And I think that it's, it's really important that, so when you were talking about, you were wondering if your therapist, you know, thinks that about you, your therapist is just a human, right? We're all just right. human. And then I think the other part of it is that it has opened up these conversations where people are reading the book with their therapist because it's given them permission to say, in, you know, in the book, I say to my therapist at one point, I ask him if point blank, if he likes me. Mm. And now people know that, that, it is about this relationship so that you can learn from this relationship and take it out into the world with you. And I say at the beginning of the book that study after study shows that the most important factor in the success of your therapy isn't the therapist's training or the number of years that they've been doing this or the modality that they're using. All of those are important. Don't get me wrong. They're all important. But the most important factor is the relationship you have with your therapist. And so this book, I think, has has really, you know, people knew that kind of instinctively that their therapist was very important to them. You know, we all go out of therapy and during the week we think, oh, I got to tell my therapist this next week or, oh, I want to bring this up with my therapist or, oh, this reminds me of that thing we were talking about in therapy last week. We carry our therapists around with us in that way. But I think that sometimes somehow we don't acknowledge that in the room with our therapists. And this, this book has really opened up. Uh, people have been emailing me about all of the great conversations they've been having with their therapists about the relationship with their therapist and that how that's deepened the work that they're doing. So that's really gratifying to hear. Yeah. Yeah. And I really, that also really resonates with me because I think what one of the things that your book does is shows that therapists are people to who have our own problems and our own, you know, areas that we are working on in our own personal growth, as well as that we think about our clients, that we care about them. You know, it's not just, it's not like when they leave, we forget all about them. And then, you know, we have to like refresh our memory. Who is this? And I'm going to be talking to them when they come back, you know? <laughs> well, that's, I think that that's so important that you mentioned that because one of the things that people are surprised about when they read the book is how much our clients matter to us. Yeah. You know, and and also that there's a boundary at the same time. So it's this interesting relationship. I don't think it's replicated in any other kind of relationship that I can think of off the top of my head right now, where it's a professional relationship. It's a transactional relationship, right? Because they're paying you. It's there are boundaries. It's it's we don't share our issues with them. They're sharing their issues with us. But there's so much emotion 
in that relationship on both sides, that we care very much about the people that we see and they care if the relationship is working well, they care very much about us. We matter to them. They matter to us. Yeah, I think that's the most beautiful takeaway from the book of all to me as a therapist, because, you know, that it's the relationship is real, even if it ends as a professional relationship doesn't mean that it wasn't real when it was going on. And also, you know, of course, I have I still think about clients who I'm not working with anymore. It's not like they cease to exist just because I'm not meeting with them anymore. You know, right. you kind of carry something of people that you've had a relationship with. You carry it sort of in your heart. Absolutely. In fact, you can see in the book how those relationships evolved, you know, between me and the four main people that I follow. Either you'll also hear about other people in the book, but you can see those are really rich, deep relationships. And and they're not anomalies. You know, I think that, that, you know, people say, oh, well, are those the four that turned out that way? No, there's also a relationship in the book where I, you know, I write about a patient where I couldn't help her no matter how hard I tried. I couldn't help her. And, you know, to this day that stays with me too, because I did care about her and I felt a sense of failure that, I couldn't find the right way to get in with her. And no matter what my consultation group said about, you know, how many times we went over it, the bottom line is I couldn't help her and, and I felt bad about it. And so our patients live with us that way too, that, you know, if you, if you took those transcripts and brought them before your consultation group and, and they said, look, you did everything exactly as you should have, you tried 500 different things and none of them worked and we don't, we're out of ideas too. At the same time, on a personal level, you feel like, wow, I could see the thing that was tripping her up. And I so wanted her to be able to see it. And I was not skilled enough to be able to help her to see it in a way that she would be open to it. Yeah. Well, and that just for me illuminates the whole, it is a relationship. The other person's part of it too. And, you know, it isn't just what we do. It's where they are and where they're ready to go at the time. And, you know, what they gain from the experiences is their part, you know, not to say we were the professionals and we're supposed to be doing the skillful work, but it's the interplay between the two people that really makes the magic of what therapy is. Right, right. And I think that there's something so human about it that that's what I wanted to write about. I even write about how I Google stalked my therapist at one point, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and then I had this thing where I, I found, you know, really went down the internet rabbit hole with him and it was this thing where I found an obituary of his father. And it turned out that his father had died at a relatively young age. He had been a runner and uh, suddenly dropped out of a heart attack. And I had been waxing poetic in my therapy sessions about my close relationship with my aging father and how I was so glad I had this time with him. And once I read that obituary, I stopped talking about my father. I I felt like it would pain my therapist, which I know as a therapist, you should not do, right? I should have Mm -hmm. just said, I I found this information about you and now I'm uncomfortable and I want to bring it up. But I couldn't do it. And I acted really weird in the the following several sessions because I was editing myself. Mm -hmm. And, and finally, and he knew something was weird, but he didn't know what it was. And finally I confessed and then all the air returned to the room and we could talk about it. And we had this great conversation, not only about my father in a different way, but also about my therapist and me without him crossing any boundaries or getting into his personal life in any way, but talking about what that experience was like and, and what our relationship means and how, This is a real relationship in a lot of ways, you know, in a different way from a relationship out there. And and it really changed, you know, sort of brought our work to another level. And I think every time that we reveal the truth of who we are, it deepens the work. And it's just so hard to do, even though you go to therapy and you think, I'm here to be honest. I'm here to talk about the things that I feel shame about. I'm here to talk about these things that feel very vulnerable to me. A lot of times we don't because we still feel like we want the therapist to like us. And if we tell them this, they will think differently 
about us. And I hear this so much gender wise, too. A lot of times men will come in and they'll say, you know, I've never told anyone this before. And then what they tell me feels so mild, you know, and I feel so much compassion for them because it says to me that they had nobody that they could be even a bit vulnerable with, you know, and then women will come in and they'll say, I've never told anyone this before, except for my mother, my sister, my best friend, right? So it might be like (laughs) one to three people that they've told, but to them, it feels like they haven't told anybody. To them, it feels like it's a secret. But I think that the point is that when we come to therapy, we are telling our therapist things that nobody else knows. And sometimes even then we hold back. And so you can see in the book with my patients, what happens when they hold back, you can, and and eventually, you know, come forward. You can see in the book what happens when I hold back and eventually come forward. And there are two like big things that I'm not telling my therapist when I first come there, like glaringly big things. And I don't think that I'm keeping a secret necessarily. I just, I've, I've rationalized it to myself that, oh, well, this is the big crisis and, you know, that other stuff, you know, it's not really that important. And I think we rationalize to ourselves all kinds of ways where we minimize the things that we really do need to be talking about. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the, the great things about this book is it kind of shows how our relationship and communication dynamics that we use out in the world even show up in the therapy space. But, you know, when we're with our therapist, but the therapeutic relationship is a place where you can examine that and take it apart and go, what's, what's coming up here? What's this about? And where else do you do that? I mean, to that level, who else wants to talk to that level about, you know, (laughs) why you chose to bring up or not bring up a certain topic and what you're avoiding, you know, who, who else in our lives really has the patience or attention span to do that, you know? Well, but also you're not going to hear it the same way from someone who has a vested interest in changing you, right? So often if someone brings something up, if it's your partner and they say something like, you know, I think you're avoiding this or, you know, when you do this, the person's going to get very defensive. I think therapists, so true. you know, have the, have the vantage point of not living in that person's outside life. And so it makes it a lot safer. And they also have the skill to bring something up in a way that won't feel shaming, that won't feel critical in the, in the same way. So I think that that's important too. I think, you know, one of the things when you were just talking about how we have this process of therapy, it's so different from what I do in the Dear Therapist column because I only get a letter and the person is telling me their story in a particular way in that letter. And in the therapy room, you get to ask questions. You get to really go in there and look at that story. You get the next week. If let's say that you think about something after the fact and you say, you know, we do this all the time as therapists where you think about it later and you, or you're writing your chart note and, and you say, oh, wow, I, I, this is something where I want to go with this. And you get to do that the next week with a dear therapist letter. It's it's just here's the letter and you have to imagine the therapeutic experience and write your response to the therapeutic experience, not to here's what I think you should do with your mother in law. Yes, (laughs) yes. So that's that's a very skillful service to offer. I mean, I don't I think about that and it's like, wow, how would you know to go there with it? And you know, be confident that that was the way to go. So I'm very impressed by everything you're doing. Your your book is amazing. And actually, I'm super excited about it being developed into a TV series because I, I would, you know, I just can't wait to see what it's going to be like. Yeah, well, thank you. I, um, you know, and I want to say one last thing about the title with maybe you should talk to someone I know that we're talking to therapists right now, but I really didn't mean it to imply that everybody should go talk to a therapist, although, of course, I find it very valuable. But I think we just need to talk to each other more. And that that's Mm -hmm. what I was trying to say. So if I think if this book is about anything, it's about the power of connection. Yes, I, I agree with you. And that's what I take away from it. That's what the feeling was when I read it. So I wanted to share it with everyone therapists and non-therapists and my clients. So I know it's a huge bestseller and can be found everywhere, but 
If people want to know more about what you're doing, what's the best way to get that info? They can go to my website, which is lauriegottlieb.com. They can follow me on Twitter at lauriegottlieb1. I have a public Facebook page and I have an Instagram page that I'm still trying to figure out how to use. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I think Twitter and the and the website will have the most up to date information about new projects and things like that. And and also where I'm, I'm you know where I'm going on book tour because I'm still in the middle of my book tour. Oh great! Well, Lori, thank you so so much for taking the time to be my guest on Therapy Chat today. Oh, thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to my interview with Lori Gottlieb. If you haven't read, maybe you should talk to someone yet. I think that you are probably very curious about reading it now. I hope so. Anyway, I loved that book and I just love the many layers. I hope I did an adequate job of asking her what I wanted to know. And I hope that you enjoyed listening to our interview. As always, I'd love to hear your feedback. You can go to the therapychatpodcast.com website and click on the speak pipe link to leave me a message, or you can send me an email at therapychat.podcast at gmail.com. I'd love to know what you think. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Today's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes. There are many ways to keep your practice organized, but Therapy Notes is the best. Their easy-to-use, secure platform lets you not only do your billing, scheduling, and progress notes, but also create a client portal to share documents and request signatures. Plus, they offer amazing unlimited phone support, so when you have a question, you can get help fast. To get started with the practice management software trusted by over 60,000 professionals, go to therapynotes.com and start a free trial today. If you enter promo code THERAPYCHAT, they will give you two months to try it out for free. Just another reminder that if you'd like to become a member of Therapy Chat, supporting the podcast while receiving fun member perks and being able to communicate with me one-on-one, go to patreon.com slash therapy chat. If every subscriber donated just $1 per month, Therapy Chat would be able to keep going strong indefinitely. Thanks so much for your support. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.